Hello everybody. Um, I just wanted to go ahead and make my video for today. Um, I was hoping the clouds wouldn't have come in like they did so it would be bright and sunny and so I can show you that I do have nice weather down here in Oklahoma. Um, which could also change at the drop of a hat because we're getting into tornado season. So um, very exciting with that. I love bad weather. I love, 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 love bad weather. It's very exciting. I, I think in another life I would have been a storm chaser and gotten my meteor meteorology degree. But um, anyway, what I said I was gonna talk about today were my experiences in rehab. I've been to rehab three times um, and the first and second, well, the first and second were at the same place, but I had completely different experiences uh, those two times. And then there was this last time uh, in uh, November, uh, December, and January, um, end of November, all of December, beginning of Jan uh, January that I was in. Um, and that one was really awesome. It was, it was the same feel as the first one, just real in there with really awesome people, people who were really positive and um, people that I've made friends with. And that's what it was like the first time. I went to this place in St. Louis called Harris House and um, London Fog. Um, it was, it's very holistic. Like they don't, like they follow the 12 steps, but as far as what they teach you in classes was very, therapeutic in a sense of like they, they focus on this thing called CBT cognitive behavioral therapy um, and so that's kind of how they helped teach us is teach us how to behave differently from our triggers and things that make us want to go use or drink um, and that was a big component there was a lot of components of teaching about the disease of alcoholism and drug addiction and um, then we did watch some videos on our drugs of choice, but that wasn't really a main thing, uh, like at some other rehabs. Um, and um, I was just in there with really awesome people because it was my first time being in rehab and I was scared. I was really scared. I was scared to go. I didn't know what it was going to be like. And I couldn't have asked for a better experience that first time. The people that I met in there, so amazing. Not barely any of us stayed sober after that though but um you know the the percentage or the ratio of people who succeed from going to rehab and those who don't is like one in nine will be successful and stay in recovery um and to the best of my knowledge none of us who were there that time have stayed sober um there was one girl I was really close to, and she and I hung out a lot afterwards. Um, for the life of me, I cannot remember her name right now. because that, that was six years ago. Um, but she lived over by where my parents lived in the St. Louis suburbs. And um, I mean, she literally lived like five minutes away. So she and I hung out a lot after we got out. Um, and it was very comforting to be there with people like that, people that you could actually hang out with outside of rehab, because that's, there's been, like, it's always easy to get along with people because you're stuck in the same space, but when you actually make a friend that you can be friends with on the outside, not just someone that you're making do with because you're stuck in a, in a room with them, um, which Harris House wasn't like that anyways. The front door was unlocked. You could leave at any time. Um, and like we got to go down to the um, corner store at a little um, gas station to get cigarettes and sodas and candy and things like that so we weren't on lockdown and I think that's what made what makes the place kind of successful because it's only for there for people who want to be there um, and it, that's what it was I wanted to be there so it never even once occurred to me like I could go out get some drugs and come back and whatever like no like I wanted to be there I wanted to get clean and it just look at this now now it's all hazy oh um but uh it was very 
cathartic. And I really loved it. I just, afterwards, when I got out, I had a run in with some of my friends I used. And within six months, those friends stopped talking to me. Um, I drank and used. It was more than I drank. And then because I drank, I used. Um, and my, my real life friends that I had for five years, four or five years at that point, um, just ghosted me like within six months. They never said, hey, the fact that you use really upset us. We need to make sure we need to know that you're serious. Nothing like that. They just ghosted me. Stopped calling, stopped responding to texts, stopped inviting me out. Um, it was really heartbreaking. And for probably almost a year, I would just sit in my room and cry a couple times a week because um, I felt so alone. I'd had these friends for four plus years and they just deserted me without even a word. But I found out in recent years that it was allegedly because I had used that one time and I didn't apologize to them for having used because that's something that you do, apparently, or are supposed to think of to do, but it just shows that they weren't my true friends. And I think truthfully, me getting clean and sober held up a mirror to their faces because they were all heavy drinkers, like heavy, 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 heavy drinkers. Um, and uh, to them, it was such a shock when I came out as a meth addict. They were like, what? We just thought you drank all the time with us. I was like, yeah, I do. And then when we're not drinking, I'm out using drugs. So, um, but it held up a mirror to their faces about, probably made them think, am I an alcoholic? I drink like this. Do I have a problem too? And they just couldn't stand to be around me when I wasn't drinking. Um, so I'm not, well, I was upset about it at the time for about a year. It just, in, the, in hindsight now, it just means that they didn't deserve my friendship, didn't um, understand me, and they just weren't good friends. So I've striven since then to only make good friends but I ran into another friend group again after that, that once they found out about my drug use, passed, because I was, excuse me, I was sober at that time. Um, and uh, once they found out about my drug pass, they just really judged me and kind of cast me out. And um, someone who I'd been really close to in that group told me I was utterly disgusting and a terrible human being. Um, so I haven't had the best <laughs> of luck with friends when it comes to my sobriety um but this time around after getting out of landmark i've made some really good friends through my aa group um and um it's really fun it's nice to have friends who understand um not that people who aren't addicts don't understand or aren't em empathetic but um i'd say it's easier to talk to somebody who has been there than someone who hasn't because it's just empathy and I've been there are two different things. Like I, I would rather, even if it was an alcoholic that I hated at my group, I'd rather talk to him about it than talking to someone who doesn't know what it's like and say, this is what's going on with me, blah, 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 blah. Like it's just, Empathy only goes so far, but hearing I've been there, this is what I did, is so much more helpful. Um, so no offense to people who have offered to be there to talk anytime. I'm not, I'm not saying that it wasn't kind and that it wasn't very sweet and thoughtful, but mostly I find talking to people who are also in recovery um, is, is the most help. Like I have my sponsor, I call him every day or text him every day at least. Um, so yeah, but um, yeah, the, back to the first time at Harris House, um, yeah, we could leave, so we could go out and smoke whenever we wanted. There weren't like there weren't locks on the doors, uh, anything like that, and um, it was just really cool. There was me, Chunk, Shane. Um, 
what the hell was his name? He's so hot. Like afterwards, he started working out and got really hot and keeps on posting pictures of himself shirtless on his Facebook all the time. Living for it. Living for it. Um, dang it, I cannot remember his name. Huh. But yeah, Shane, Shane and I were both meth addicts. I actually found out about the recovery house because of him. Um, or the rehab because of him. Because that's where he went. He and I had used together right before he went back in. For the second, his second time. It was my first time. And he was the one who, who convinced me that I needed to go there. Um, and it was a good convincing. Not convincing. That makes it sound like I didn't want to go there. I did. But I was like, I had a lot of trepidations about it. And that was basically all calmed as soon as I started talking to people. I was, I was worried that people weren't going to like me because I was gay. I was so fearful of that. I was fearful of getting in there and people being like, bag, you know, and um, stuff like that. So I just, I didn't know what to do, but I was talking to some people. Like I, I was there maybe 10 minutes. I went up to the common area in the men's side and was standing there. And um, a guy came up and talked to me and another person came up and talked to me and then another. And then it was just, I was very eased. Like I felt really peaceful about that because I was like I'm as you can tell like I'm I'm pretty obviously gay um I do try to tone it down sometimes like at family functions um things like that I don't want to <sighs> embarrass my mom any or as little as possible but um um I was worried that me being very obviously gay, um, that I wouldn't have any friends. And it was quite the opposite. All the girls loved me. Like they loved me. Um, and at that time I was still playing piano and I, my, I brought a bunch of music with me and we would sit down in the basement where there was a, a room that they, we did yoga in and there were AA meetings that took place in there, but there was a piano. And so we'd sit in there and play piano and um you know have a good time and the girls loved it they just they absolutely loved me um not to toot my own horn i'm not saying like eh, everybody loves me like no i'm just mean like we all got along really really well um there was one point that there were four of us who were meth addicts that were in there and apparently that was like a record um and it was i went in like two or three days before Christmas and I didn't get out until the end of January. Um, but during that time, there was a stretch where there were so few people, but there were still the four of us that were meth addicts and they were like the, the rehab center was just blown away. Like we've never had this many people with, with meth addiction in here at the same time. It's usually only like one or two. Um, so I thought that was really fun. Like uh, that's, that was something else that made it to where people understood. Like if I said something gross that, that happened while using meth, they would be like, dude, been there, done that. It's okay. You know, and stuff like that. Like I, I did terrible things whenever I was high. Sometimes I would, I didn't, I never broke the law to the best of my knowledge, besides the fact that I did drugs. I mean, that's illegal. But um, I never like stole anything. Well, that's a lie, sorry. One time I stole, twice, I stole checks from my parents and cashed them so I could get drugs. So that's a lie, I did break the law. Never mind. I'm a criminal. Well, it's already am a criminal. There are things about me that if they were known and the proper people found out, I would be in prison. So um, those are things I'm going to keep to myself. Um, my therapist thinks I should write a, um, a memoir about my life because she thinks it's interesting enough and that people would, would get something from it. I'm like, well, one, at first I have to get sober first, but two, it's just the stuff that I've done that could land me in prison. Um, I don't know what the statutes of limitations are uh, for some of it, but I bet a lot of it is... Um, especially towards the end of my 12 years, um, 
of being a gentleman of the night. Um, I know for a fact some of those, I, I still broke the law all the way up until the end. Um, but I mean, just having been a gentleman of the night, that's illegal as well. So, you know, um, when some you lose some, I guess. I don't know. I don't know why I said that. But um, anyways, so that was the first time at rehab. The second time was the same place, but it just it didn't have the same feel. The people, we didn't all mesh together very well, and I didn't make any friends that time. So it was just really awkward. Um, but um, it was still helpful that I was kind of forced to go so I didn't stay in recovery very long after I was done. I, um, oops. I, um, uh, sorry, let me get a drink. I, um, lost my train of thought. Damn it, I hate it when this happens. Oh, the second time. I'm talking about some of them with the second time. Yeah, I just didn't have the same feel, and um, I didn't make any friends, and so it was just a little bit of a womp womp. So whenever I was done, I didn't have that same strive for wanting to stay sober like I did the first time, even though I did mess up shortly after getting out because I wasn't working a program. Um, but the second time, I was just like, all right, parents are please. I'll stick with this for a couple months, and then whatever. And I, I think I... I don't know how long I lasted, but um, I went to meetings for a while. I remember that. So I might have lasted a few months, maybe maybe more, but um, I, I knew it wasn't going to be the time that sticks. I didn't want it then. I was in a really bad place in my life, and I just wallowed all the time. And the way to get away from the wallowing was to use or drink. And I um, would get as many escapes as I possibly could. If I couldn't use, I would convince my parents to give me some money so I could go drink with my old friend group, um, which they wouldn't all come out. It was just basically one or two people from that, from that group. Um, you know, and that would happen every four to six weeks. But what was more important were the times that I had money to myself and I would use that on drugs instead of paying parents back for money they'd lent me, anything like that. I was a terrible person. Um, I was a really terrible person. I don't know if I'm still all that great of a person even though I'm sober. I'm working on myself and that's one of the things that working the, the program does for you is that you're, it's supposed to help you become a figure out all your flaws and get you to change and grow as a person. I put this chocolate on this table and I guess it was kind of hot. It made the chocolate all soft. It's what it's the candy bar that um, Sabrina gave me. I already ate the caramel one and Sabrina that was so good. So I'm eating this one now and I ate some of this for breakfast. Mmm. So good. Mm. Mm. But after that second time, I was sober, like I said, a few months, maybe more. And um, then I went right back. And the first time I went was in 2004. 14. I've gone every I've gone every two years 2014, 2016 and then um, 2018 well 19 I guess it wasn't two and a half years or I guess it wasn't every two years wait well 14, no 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 two, well 2014, 2015 it was like right at like I it went in at the end no it was 2014 Do the math. 2014, I was... Mm. 
Yeah, it was 2014 because I turned, I, I, when I went into rehab, I was 28 and um, I um, turned 29 after that and that was the saddest birthday I ever had. Um, most of my birthdays since getting sober um, have been very womp womp, mostly because I don't have any friends or didn't have any friends. I have friends now, but mostly in the past was because I didn't have any friends to celebrate my birthday with. You know, um, having your mom bake you a cake and I mean, have siblings come over with their kids is only so fun. And actually there was one birthday where they did that, but I was in my bedroom using and I completely ignored them. My mom was so upset and I was just too, one, I was embarrassed that I was using and two, I just didn't want to. Like when I'm, when I'm high, I'm a completely different person. I will shut you out. You could be talking to me and I will just go mm -hmm, and walk away and now I've caught what you said. Um, nothing. Or if I did hear what you said, I would ignore it because I don't want to deal with it. You know, I'm a completely different person. I'm so glad you guys get to see me this way um, and like this all the time. Sometimes whenever I would be using, if I was in between times of using and I was in a crash, I would be like zero energy. I'd be like this. Hey guys, so how you doing today? You know, it was just, it was not, I wasn't myself um, at all. And right before I went into rehab this time, this or this last time, this third time, um, I had fallen into binging every weekend. I went from, you know, once a month to going hard every weekend. And part, halfway through it, I begged my parents to let me go to rehab and they wouldn't. And then finally, after another four weeks of that, they they finally conceded and like, okay, we need to get you to rehab. But they made it sound like it was their idea. <laughs> um, so it took a while, but we finally found a place and it was a place called Landmark Recovery. Um, There's one here in the Oklahoma City area, but it was closed due to some stuff. They said renovations, but once I got to the, to the landmark that I went to, um, I found out the skinny. Um, but um, all that tea, honey, I'm gonna spill that tea. Um, do I still need these? Yes, yes I do. Well, no I don't. It's just my eyes readjusting to the lights. Um, I hope you guys can see me very well. Ugh, if this video sucks, I'm gonna have to do it over. Ugh. Let me see how the light is right here. Oh yeah, we're gonna start this whole thing over, I think. Ugh, uh, that's 23 minutes. Mm. I hate it when I don't think about things. And now I do need my sunglasses on because, oh, look at that satellite dish. We don't use satellite. We use Cox Cable. I should get a little incentive for talking about that. Oh, well, yeah, I'm not gonna start the video over. I don't think I can talk for another 23 minutes and then still add more on and remember where I was in this story. But um, I convinced my parents to send me to rehab and I went in, um, we found a place, I mean, and um, the one here was closed. So they're like, well, we will fly you for free to the, to the closest available location. And I was like, they will fly me for free. Let's do this one. And they were, they did, um, um, smart recovery as their basis for their program, which I love, uh, their smart recovery meetings that you can go to and like, instead of doing AA, um, but the smart recovery in info was in certain classes that we had. So, um, it was really, it was really nice. But, um, so I fly there and I was like, Oh my God, this is going to suck. I'm not, it's the same thing. Like the first time I was like, I'm not going to know anybody and you know, whatever, whatever. Well, I, first I was put on the men's side 
And it was like that. They were everybody was nice like the first couple days. Hi, how are you doing? Drew, right? You know, it'd be out smoking cigarettes because I smoked while I was in rehab. And um, but after that, people just grew cold. The guys did not there was no camaraderie except for the one room that everyone dubbed the relapse room. It was it was one of the group rooms, but at after dinner or after groups were over it would get taken over by these guys who would um watch terrible shows involving drugs and alcohol um on on this guy's um fire stick um um i forget who does the fire stick is that amazon i think it's amazon amazon fire stick and um i would go in there sometimes and try to watch something but i was just like what the heck are you guys doing why are you watching this you know it's not healthy it's not going to help your recovery and I said something about it one time and that's when I found out that it was called the relapse room I was like oh okay so I stopped going in there I'm not gonna hang out with people who weren't serious about their recovery um, well one time I was out smoking and I saw the girls were out as well so I went over and talked to the girls and they were like <gasps> like on me like white on rice and they were just like oh my god you're so you're so this you're so good oh my god and i was just like man i wish i could live on the girls side they were like well men do live over here i was like what and um so it was just it took a lot of finagling many days it took about i was there a little over a week before i finally got to move over to the women's side although it's really the co-ed side but they were women's side but it was a co-ed side um, and that made all the difference in the world. It was people who cared for each other, people who liked to hang out with each other. We would sit and play cards all night, all day. If we were in group, that's, I, I played so much rummy. I mean, I learned how to play rummy there. I, I used to play gin rummy with my mom, but I, I didn't know how to play rummy rummy. Oh my God. I got really good at it. One time I, I came in first uh, at the table, which was saying a lot because I was playing against people who were really good. Um, so um, that was something that happened. We'd play rummy. We would watch TV together. And that was, of course, during football time. So every freaking Saturday and Sunday, all there was on was stupid freaking football. Huh. I hate football. I hate it so much. Um, and I mean, my, I have deep seated issues of why I hate it. And I'm not going to go into those now, but anyways, when football was on, I was like, all right, I'm going to go to somewhere else and watch a movie, which is what we usually did. Um, and the staff there was second to none out of any staff I've ever had at a rehab facility. I mean, a couple of them, I, I, I pretty much became friends with. I remember I was leaving, like they were crying and they made this little ball for me that was clear. And inside it said deep thought or good thoughts for Drew or something like that written on the outside of it. And uh, they told me I couldn't read them until um, I got on the airplane. So I was like, do I really have to wait till the airplane? I can't read them in the taxi, but I'm glad I didn't read them in the taxi. Um, and that's another story. But I read them on the plane and um, it was all really fun stuff, just really cute stuff like um, affirmations and things like you can do this. And one was like, your mustache is boss or bomb. I forget what it said, I'll have to find it. Um, but there was one complimenting my mustache, which I've trimmed. I don't know if you've noticed, it's trimmed now. So it's not as long which I thought that might be me doing my part to protect myself. I don't, it's not really. Having facial hair uh, right now is um, bad. So it doesn't matter if it's just shorter or not. Mmm. But on the whole, this time at Landmark Recovery, and they have them all over the US, um, staff was phenomenal. Um, food was bearable. There were times, there were, I mean, 
people complained about the food a lot. And all I could think to myself was, at least you're not homeless on the street having to beg for money for food. That's what I kept telling myself. If I if we had a meal that was too salty or you know, we didn't seem to get enough or you know, whatever. I was like, just because I'm hungry, still hungry doesn't mean I need to eat. I know I ate enough to last me. But if like, yeah, if there weren't seconds, people were all like, what? No seconds? So um, it was just, for some people, they had a different mentality. But yeah, the food was great. Um, the food was actually, no, it was great. There was this one chef. Her name was, um, oh, I can I remember her name. Yeah, it's gone now. Wow, I can't believe I ever forgot her name. But she was this big black lady and everything she made was amazing. I like every time that she made cornbread, I would go up and be like, can I just get seconds of cornbread? And it got to where the women's side went first, the whole women's side went first and the whole men's side went second to eat. When initially it was only certain colors because everybody was put into a color group and only certain colors went first. So one color from the men's side, one color from the women's side would go together um, at noon. And then the other um, groups, two, two colors, would go at 1230. Um, except for breakfast. Breakfast was always all together. But uh, that was because so few people ever came to breakfast. Like all, everybody could fit into the cafeteria because it was a small cafeteria. I was really surprised when I got there. Excuse me. But um, when it got to where just the whole women's side went first was because women were getting their butts pinched and bumped into. And um, one guy said, because we were in the yoga studio or the workout room and we were doing yoga. And a guy said, I'm going to bring my camera next time to record that. And um, but it was after Robin's butt cut. Oh, do you hear the donkey? Maybe they'll walk by. Um, after Rob Robin's butt got pinched. Oh, she was livid, livid, livid. And that put a stop to the co-ed lunch and dinners. Um, so, um, yeah. But I met my closest friend, I think I've probably had in a long time, um, at Landmark. Um, and her name is Channing. I don't know if she'll watch this, but um, she got there about the same time I did, maybe a couple days before I did. No, she did not, because I stayed 46 days. She, yeah, no, 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 we got there about the same time, but I ended up staying longer than she did. And she ended up getting out a couple days early. So, um, I really thought my last week, week and a half there was just going to suck without her because she and I got so close. Like, you know, you guys don't know how twisted my sense of humor is. Like I'm silly on here. I can go dark, 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 dark. And I knew she was a good person. Um, one time, well, not a good person. I don't mean it like that. Cause we're, <laughs> I won't, I'm not going to spill her tea, but, um, she is a good person. Don't get me wrong. We've all done bad things when we're high and she did many bad things when she was high. But um, um, if I would say something so off the wall about any subject, about any person, about anything, and she wouldn't just laugh, she would like add on to it and then we would laugh and then we would just go back and forth about it. You know, like I, I'm, I'm one who's, if I think of something really stupid or what I think is really funny. Something that's really stupid might be really funny. I might think it's really funny, but I'll think of something and then I'm like, it was the perfect place to be like, just say it, <laughs> you know, like what's gonna happen? Um, and people loved my laugh. They were like, all right, Drew's coming around the corner. I can hear his laugh. And I do talk loud. I talk really loud and I talk especially loud for these videos because I don't want it to be too quiet. Um, But um, Channing was a fellow family member, if that makes sense, uh, to those who are in the know. 
Uh, and then we had Chris, who was also a family member. Uh, he was family. And um, so there were three of us there who were rainbow flag flyers. Um, and it was just really comforting because the first time I went, I only had Shane and he was interested in me relationship and sexually, sexual wise, which almost got us both or one of us booted out of there. Um, but this time, none of that happens. I don't think, I think I probably turned off Chris enough by just talking, but he was really nice. Um, and, um, it was really, it was really fun having a couple, cu couple other people in there who were like me. Um, whoa, I'm not in the frame. Um, but I had a really good time there and I focused on my sobriety at the days that I could go. I, I sunk into a really bad depression. Um, when I was there, there was one whole week where I just stayed in bed. I, I, and it was like that first week it happened and then it happened again about week three. And I probably only made it to like four groups that whole week. Um, and when I was on the men's side, I barely went to group. I didn't want to be there with them. Once I discovered I could move over to the women's side, I was like, get me over there as quick as you can. And um, we had to have it go through all the proper channels and have my therapist sign off on it and everything and it was a big ordeal but it could have been handled in a couple days if the right people had been let known about it sooner because my therapist didn't know until the day i told her which was the day i moved ended up moving um but like people would move out of the women's side and i'd be like can i move in there like i just you know and they were like oh we'll we'll send a message to so and so again and i was just like it was very disheartening so for that first week I didn't care about going but I was also in a big depression so I slept all day I would get up go to breakfast come back sleep get up for lunch come back sleep and it made being made to feel like I was like not enough that I needed to feel important to people but when it was made clear that like, since I was no longer new, people didn't have to be nice to me anymore. It made it all the easier to avoid people and, um, and just say to myself, um, oh, sorry, I'm reminiscing about stuff that I can't go into. Um, there were quite a few attractive guys i was really surprised by how many attractive guys that would that ended up being there during my stay um there was one that that got there like the day before i left and um he was extremely handsome like extremely extremely handsome like model handsome um and they were out playing football in the courtyard and i guess he got sweaty and he lifted up his shirt to dry sweat from off of his face. And I saw his chest and stomach and I made an audible gasp scream. And my, the girl who was working there, I think it was Hillary. It was Hillary or it was Tiffany. I can't remember which, which one of them it was. Tiffany and Hillary are the ones who made that ball for me. I think it was Hillary and she just lost it. She's like, keep it in your pants, Drew. It's like, I can't help it. <laughs> um, it was really nice. But yeah, there were quite a few guys there who were very attractive. And I can tell, well, some of them I, I said things to just because I didn't care. I didn't give a shit. I had no filter while I was there. Oh, crap. I just cussed. Um, but I, I, if they were hot, I'd just be like, hey, man, think you're really attractive. Not trying to get in your pants. Just wanted to let you know. And they'd be like, oh, okay. Well, there was one guy who I said that to, and as long as I wouldn't say continually after, he didn't have a problem with me. And I think he would purposely wear stuff that was sexy uh, when he was com coming over to hang out with us. Because unless he only brought sexy clothes, I don't know. But like he would bring stuff that would show off his chest hair. 
he was um, um, part Arab, part Italian, I think. He was so hot. Um, and um, yeah, every time I saw a glimpse of his chest hair, I got really excited. And um, there were a couple other people that I, there was one guy um, who I, I'm friends with. Um, this is very cre like creeper of me to say I did this because it's terrible. You know, it, it's like it's just the same as a woman being harassed by a man. But he, it made him uncomfortable whenever I, this person, it made him uncomfortable whenever I said, you're cute. I'm not into you, but you're cute. Um, so he was like, don't say that. That makes me uncomfortable. So every chance I had. I would say something. I'd be like, your hair looks really cute today. Or like, that's a really cute shirt. It's so cute on you. Like, I mean, I would, I would just do anything to say cute at him. And um, <laughs> he would generally put down his cigarette from, because we were outside smoking usually whenever this would happen. And he'd be like, all right, I'm going inside. <laughs> put out his cigarette and go inside. I thought it was funny. I did like, I think it would only be bad at me if I actually wanted to sleep with him, and I did not. Um, none of the guys there I really wanted to sleep with. I didn't have those feelings while I was there. But I can appreciate a sexy man. Um, and the, I did, very much so. I played the most sports I've, I ever have, where I touch a football. It was a game that they made up. But... Um, it involved throwing a football up into the air and everyone had to like try to catch it and add a number of points. And if you got to a, a thousand points, then you were the person who threw the football. Um, and I won one time. I caught the football enough to win to get to a thousand points. So, you know, as someone who hates football and isn't very, wasn't very athletic at that time, um, you know, I was very proud of myself. Um, so it was fun, but, um, we tended to get really rough with it. And after like 30 minutes of playing that game, it was just, I, I, maybe I did it for like 45 minutes, but I was just like beat to hell and not in a good way. Like, not like in a rugby way. I like, like getting beat up in rugby, but like getting an elbow to the stomach on accident or having someone step on your feet r repeatedly. Um, I guess that all happens in rugby too. I still prefer the rugby beat up than, um, whatever we did. Um, but I got to play with the boys and that was fun. I felt kind of butch. London Fog, you're on Z1077 with the Drucifer, sitting outside. Looking at the pasture. Hoping that the animals will come by so I can show them. I swear, one of these times I'm going to show you guys those climbing goats. And there's so many leaves budding on those trees that they eat from. That they, like, they can get to them now. So, I'm ecstatic to show you the goats. Um, it's, it's awesome. But uh, I digress. Um, every time I have London Fog, I, I'm always in the middle of something. I don't think I was this time. I think I was just saying I did sports, and I was surprisingly not bad at it. Um, but yeah, I was there for 46 days, and um, the, the requirement for you to come in there is 35 days. But I wanted to stay longer, uh, as long as I could, because I actually wanted to go to a 90-day rehab. But um, I'm glad I didn't. Because I wouldn't have met these wonderful people that are now in my life. Um, so it was all very meant to be. Um, God meant for me to get there when I got there and make the friends that I did and stay as long as I needed to to make the rest of the friends that I did. Because there were people who got there after me who left before me. And that sucked. Like thinking about that, I was like, no. <laughs> it's like all the people that I know are going to be gone by the time I actually leave. But no, I made enough friends that there were people still there that whenever I left, like I was missed. You know, it wasn't like, you know, whatever. I don't know what I was expecting or even thinking of right then, but um, 
they, they do this goodbye thing um, whenever you're leaving where they everybody says something like uplifting and their favorite thing about you and that they're going to miss you. And it's at the evening community because there's community in the morning, community in the evening. And so they would do it at the uh, evening community the night before you leave. And um, everybody was so sweet. One girl even actually cried that I was leaving. Um, and um, Mandy, oh, she's so sweet. Her and her husband absolutely love me. Uh, her husband's also in recovery. He just didn't go into rehab. He was just doing that intensive outpatient, which is like rehab, but you get to go home. And you only go three days a week for like three or four hours. Um, and uh, so he was doing IOP and watching the kids, their kids, and she came in. And she came in, she was a mess. She was a wreck. And she ended up working her way into the group finally after some failed attempts. <laughs> but um, she finally got her rhythm and she and I became really close too. And whenever I was leaving, I, I didn't expect anybody to cry. And she did. And I was just like, it, like, it felt good to, like, to know that I was going to be that missed. But also, for all of those people, they all lived in Louisville. There was one other girl that was there from Oklahoma, Erin. She, she was there, got there a couple weeks before I did. And she left like three weeks before I left. Um, and um, that was cool to have a fellow Oki, someone who understood like the Oki life. Like I would talk about Brahms milk in, in front of them and Brahms ice cream. And she and I would just talk about how awesome it was. And people were like, what the heck is that? But like, you have to be from Oklahoma to know. <laughs> <laughs> um, stuff like that because I love like there's a dairy store here called Brahms and they have ice cream dairy or other dairy like milk um, and they have a little food store attached to it that's like a little grocery store but it's also a restaurant um, and they have they serve their ice cream in ways but there's also like the restaurant side too Ow. Um, and it's just so good so good. It's my, been my favorite thing about moving back to Oklahoma. Brahms milk and Brahms ice cream. Anytime I want. Anytime I want. So she and I would reminisce over missing Brahms while we were there. And, you know, we would talk about the bad weather things. We were like, Oklahoma has tornadoes. And we were both like, love them. <laughs> as long as it's not destroying my house, I love the threat of bad weather. Which I know that's terrible because there's probably going to be somebody's house who inevitably gets destroyed. So to say I like it isn't probably the most kosher thing to say. But um, I get excited by bad weather. It's been like that ever since I was a little kid. I remember being like seven or eight. And whenever the sirens would go off, we'd all go outside with a video camera. You know. <laughs> um... It wasn't very smart, to say the least. Ew. Um, sorry, I shouldn't have taken this apart. Um, need to clean that out. Um, but yeah, thunder, like thunderstorms have always excited me. Bad weather has always excited me. You know, and you can tell the testament of a true Oklahoman is when the sirens go off, you run outside. Um, now, unless it's night, if it's night, night tornadoes are scary because you can't see them. Um, but still, like I would, I it it light, or there was some lightning in one of the storms or one of the rainy days recently, and there was some lightning. I was just like, yes, bring it on! Spring is here. And um, that was, it was like, it was very short lived, very short lived. Um, and apparently some came through last night, but I slept right through it, which is a shame because I love thunderstorms, as I've already said multiple times here. But um, anyway, well, we're going on 49 minutes and 37 seconds here. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and end this um, and just say, um, Thank you for going with me on this journey through my rehab past. I hope it was at least enlightening or you got something out of it. If not, I'm not going to be offended if you're like, this video totally sucks. And I'll be like, all right, cool. Um, I mean, I'll cry myself to sleep tonight. 
but I'll say, okay, cool. <laughs> um, anyway, well, thank you for tuning in and um, I hope you all have a great day. I know it's late in the day by the time I post this, but um, I hope you have a great night and that you have nightmareless dreams, which I've had nightmares the last three nights and I'm really sick of it. So hopefully you sleep better than I do. Um, please like, share, and subscribe, and um, we will see you next time. Bye!